A fast moving fire took out three buildings and a boat tonight. Good Thursday evening, everyone. I'm Tyler Lopez. And when this all began, a boy was home alone, reacting quickly. And it appears he made a difference. The damage at this mobile home site is tonight's top story. It was just after 7 o'clock tonight. A fire would begin in one unit, then move onto a nearby shed, then destroy a boat before burning a second home. But no one was hurt as a result of what happened next. By the time it was put out, two mobile homes were destroyed. Spring Bay's fire crews spent several minutes watering the insides and underskirting around the outsides of those units. But the fire chief explains that a 13-year-old boy was inside the unit where that fire started and seemed to make the right move, getting out and trying to help. He noticed some smoke. He got out of the mobile home. He went to his neighbors, knocked on her door, told her about it. She got out of her mobile home. The rest of the family wasn't home at the time, so you know, very fortunate that way. Tragic loss for both families is all I can say. The activity at the Mill Point RV Park in East Peoria certainly drew a crowd tonight. So far, the chief says it's unclear what ignited the fire, but damage was estimated at $30,000. In national news, the former Atlanta officer charged with murdering Rayshard Brooks at a Wendy's parking lot waived his first court appearance. Former officer Garrett Rolf faces 11 charges on the right, including felony murder for the shooting death of Rayshard Brooks. Rolf's attorney, though, claims that shooting was justified. The other officer, Devin Brosnan, bonded out of jail shortly after turning himself in today. There he is. He stands charged now with aggravated assault and failure to abide by his public oath. I've never even seen a case like this. And He's disappointed in the system, to be honest with you. He, he, he was dedicating his life to law enforcement. And he had a lot of faith in the system. And that disappointment ringing out at police departments across the country. From New York to Florida, officers are already stepping down away from specialized units to prevent that. There's now a $500 bonus from the Atlanta Police Foundation being given to all of that city's police officers. United against police brutality. That was the message behind this rally organized by the normal police department earlier today, making it clear that there is no place for the actions that occurred against George Floyd in Minneapolis. Caitlin Pearson was there and brings us that story. Officers from Normal, ISU, and State Police walked side by side with members of their community. Showing a banner filled with signatures, they said they are committed to transparency and accountability. And we don't want to have the us versus them, we're all in this together. And that's why we're here today to work on um, kind of coming to a common goal. The officer who organized the rally said with everything going on, being a police officer and a person of color has sometimes been uncomfortable but she knew she had to use her position to start important conversations. In light of everything that's going on, it just honestly made me realize, you know, my position um, even more. Um, I'm able to understand um, two different perspectives, and that's why I felt like it was important for me to be able to articulate how, you know, I feel when it comes to these, inc these incidents, because I do understand from two different perspectives. Talks the mayor says he knows are necessary. But as a community, as a whole, who are we? What are our values? What will we tolerate? What will we not tolerate? I think we need that conversation. One community member who attended the rally said both officers and the public need to use this time to educate themselves on the past so we can look for a better future. I'm encouraged. I think now more than anything in my 42 years in life, I've I've seen more eyes open than I've ever seen before. I believe this is going to continue on. We're living in a new civil rights movement right now. And I think it's going to be some years before we get past this. we got a lot of work to do. In Normal, I'm Caitlin Pearson. Nearly 90 today, and we're headed towards the longest days of the year, Jesse. That's right, Tyler. Come Saturday, it's officially the first day of summer, also the longest day of the year. And uh, boy, we're feeling like summer out there. 73 still yet as we look outside Civic Center Plaza. Looks like this uh, right now with, again, temperatures up there in the uh, low to mid 70s across the area. Still 76 right now in Bloomington Normal. The uh, bluish greenish number, that is the dew point measuring that moisture. Notice how we're getting those dew points into the 60s now across the area and that means that we're uh, pumping in more of that warmth and moisture to central Illinois highs today. Yeah, we topped out near 90 for a good chunk of us, although Lincoln, you got to that 90 degree mark tomorrow. I think pretty much all of us, especially along and south of I-74, get to that 90 degree mark. We're also tracking the chance of isolated showers and storms starting tomorrow. That rain much needed details on when we could see possibly some more in your warm weekend outlook. Tyler.
Jesse, thank you. A milestone reached today. Central Illinois has now surpassed 1,200 cases of COVID-19. Nearly half the counties in our viewing area reporting new infections today. In fact, six counties added a total of 20 new cases of COVID-19. One of them, a teenage girl in LaSalle County. Of the 1,200 cases, only 207 remain active. Tazewell County also reporting a new outbreak at a long-term care facility. It's here. 14 residents at Reflections Memory Care in Washington have now tested positive for COVID-19. Three of them have died. In Peoria County now, the case count has doubled. You can see it on this graph. In just the past three weeks, they now have 410 positive cases. But the leader of the health department links that increase to more testing. In fact, more than 2,000 specimens were taken over the last week. And there have been several small outbreaks to increase the numbers as well. But the positivity rate is still under 3% in Peoria County. So she says their focus is on getting ready for phase four, which will be the longest phase. This is the phase that really takes us to a point of having a um, highly validated treatment course and or a vaccine. And those are going to be months out. So, you know, we expect guidance from phase four to come out over the weekend and early next week. And we expect it to be one that's going to be very much, um, you know, the long game. The long game. Hendrickson adds that wearing face masks remains crucial to preventing the spread because you may not know if you're carrying that virus. More compensation coming in for local nurses on the front line. The Illinois Nurses Association and the state have now agreed to a 12% increase on employees' base salary for any days worked between April 16th and June 30th of this year. This applies to registered nurses who work in mental health facilities, correctional centers, youth centers, veterans' homes, and a few other places. Also, nurses excluded from the Families First Coronavirus Response Act who worked the full time for the month of May. They also will get an extra personal business day. The head of our state unemployment system says they weren't staffed for a massive increase in claims and that the feds didn't step up. Frustration over delays in processing and payments have been a recurring theme dating back to March. Acting Director Thomas Chen of the Illinois Department of Employment Security says, in addition to a lack of employees and a need for more federal funding, IDES is also seeing a lot of retirement, taking their number of staffers with at least five years experience down by 20% over the past six years. But they do have openings. The Acting Director says IDES needs to fill 170 jobs as soon as possible. If you look at the statistics, you can see that we're receiving around 200 calls from unique claimants each week. Even though our capacity is expanding, we've only ever been able to answer about 15% of those calls. Chen says they're getting roughly 200,000 calls each week. He says criticism of the call center is justified, but he doesn't believe that other state employees could have helped navigate their systems. The battle against COVID-19 is being held with employees working around the clock to try and kill the virus locally. The Lonza plant in Mapleton saw stronger demand for their disinfectant ingredients all the way back in March than another uptick in April and in May. So at this point, all they do now is produce those ingredients. They've been proven to kill the novel coronavirus. We've gotten to the point now where we really need to focus on the specific orders. So we're making sure that we're, you know, making the product that is being used, uh, you know, for the healthcare industries, for the food packing industries. So we're not able to supply everybody. That plant manager says he believes this demand will remain high through the end of this year. While the boys have moved to Champaign, IHSA says Normal will remain the home for the girls basketball tournaments. After celebrating the boys' return to State Farm Center yesterday, today was the girls' turn. Holden Kruzmark reports from the Nice to See You Again party at Redbird Arena. The ball keeps on bouncing here at Redbird Arena. The girls' state basketball championships will stay in Normal for the next three years, something that's been a high-flying experience for the past 28. It's like coming home. I'll never forget the first time coming to the tournament. While Peoria had a strong bid to snag the girls tournament to go along with the boys. It definitely um, was in consideration uh, for a long time. IHSA officials say they felt confident in the history of Redbird Arena. The setting and location for the girls tournament here in Redbird Arena uh, had created a home for itself here. And so um, in weighing all the different factors, uh, we just felt like 
uh, girls uh, should return. That experience isn't lost on players, coaches, and fans. We take pride in providing a really tremendous championship experience for the student athletes, and that's really what this is all about is those kids that are playing on the, on the Redbird Arena floor. Basketball matters in our state, and girls basketball does, and that's why I'm just I'm so proud that we can play a small part uh, in that at Redbird Arena. Lyons says hosting the players, their families, and the communities is what helps make this tournament special, and it's expected to continue providing a $1.5 million boost to the Bloomington Normal area. Reporting from Redbird Arena, I'm Holden Cruzmark, 25 News. Holden, thank you. Another major institution preparing to bring their students back in the fall. The president at the University of Illinois system writes on-campus educational activities will resume this fall with a hybrid mixture of in-person and online classes. All three locations, Chicago, Champaign-Urbana, and Springfield, will follow residential limits with our own unique plans and calendars expected to be released within the next few weeks. Next up on 25 News, more statewide support to keep your power on, an agreement that prevents shutoffs well into the next phase of our recovery. And cameras always welcome on Grandview Drive, but this was a national cable shoot right after Jesse's full seven-day outlook.